Gospels, I want you to turn with me to that same passage we've been looking at for a number of weeks now in Ephesians chapter number five, but we're going to look at it a little bit differently here this morning. Ephesians chapter five, and uh, just hold your spot there for a few minutes. Uh, I heard about a young family that were visiting this church, and they had a little nine-year-old boy who had never been to Sunday school. So they uh, dropped him off at his Sunday school class and went on to theirs, and a few minutes later, they came back and just kind of stood outside the door. They were very anxious about him being there for his first time, wondering how it was going to go, how he would enjoy it, making sure that he wasn't anxious, and so they waited. Finally, they were dismissed, and a little boy comes out, and they get in the car to go home, and they said, son, how did you like your Sunday school class? I said, oh, it was fine, it was fine. I said, well, what did they teach you today? I said, well, I said it was an interesting story about when Israel came out of Egypt and they got over there to that big lake and uh, Pharaoh and his army was behind them and that lake was in front of them. And then the commander in chief, he got on the walkie talkie and uh, he called in airstrikes on the Egyptian army and then the uh, Navy came in and they built some pontoons and uh, put a big uh, bridge over there and built that bridge real quick and said uh, it, it, it's, they just built it in a hurry and, we, and they crossed over that big old lake. Mom and dad said, son, is that what they really taught you? He said, no, but you wouldn't believe what really did, they said. They just, you just wouldn't believe it. You really can't believe what is going on in the American family. Never dreamed when I was a kid that we would be faced with the dilemma of the home that we're facing with today. And there are a lot of people that says that the traditional family has gone by the wayside, that we will never be able to go back, that we may as well accept the fact of the modern family and uh, the traditional family values are a thing of the past and you need to get into the 21st century because we're never gonna go back. You know, I don't believe that. I don't accept that because I serve a God who can redeem and who can revive and who can restore. And I am convinced with all of my heart that if we as God's people would get to the place that we would simply apply the essentials of what God's word teaches is in the family, then we could see that all reversed. I believe we could see a return to biblical family values. You say, well, what are they? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's begin reading in verse number 23, if you will, chapter number five. God's word says this, if I can ever get to that. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's talk just a minute about some of the essentials that God has for the family. Now, we've talked about this many times in the last few weeks. I can't emphasize it strongly or often enough. Matter of fact, I am convinced that this message, matter of fact, this sermon probably needs to be preached at least one time a year and every church ought to be able to listen to it. But the first essential is what I call a godly order, a godly order. Now, I know it's Mother's Day, and this is going to sound more like a Father's Day message, but I'm just convinced that if we can get in on the order that God has in store for us, you're going to discover it's going to be one of the most fulfilling and joyous family experiences that you will ever have, a godly order. Now, the message today is not popular. Matter of fact, uh, I'm going to ask you not to get up and leave on me. I'm gonna ask you not to hit the delete button or to 
turn me off just for a few minutes until you hear all of the message. The problem has been that Christianity has snuggled up to our culture so dramatically and so closely that now then it's hard to tell the difference. And so you got to look at the essentials of the teaching of the Word of God to get the contrast, if you will. And that's where we have to begin. Men, listen, you are called by God, ordained by God, anointed by God to be the head of your family. It is a passage of scripture that God has not nullified all through these years. I want, to listen, I want you to listen to this in 1 Corinthians 11. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So now watch what God is saying here in Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11. He says that we are in partnership together. God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of the man and the man is the head of of the woman and we are to work in conjunction with each other in partnership with each other for the success of our families and God hasn't revoked that. Now we're looking this morning too at God's created order if you will. Uh, This chain of command and this symmetry that God has designed in his providence. In verse 8 You come up with this, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man, in verse 9, created for the woman, but the woman for the man. There is the order and the symmetry that God has laid out. Now, go over with me to 1 Timothy. It's just a few pages over. We've read this and studied this in recent days in our study of 1 Timothy, and we're going to get back to that in uh, a couple of weeks. In 1 Timothy chapter number 2, I want you to see verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now, that's a pretty strong passage of Scripture. But before you men get to believing that you're the cock of the walk, And before you get to believing that, wow, look it over at your wife and giving her a little smirk and saying, you see what that said. Don't do that. Because the fact of the matter is, we men are to be learning in the same fashion, in subjection unto the Lord and in silence before him. So we're to learn the same way as the women are to learn. Now watch verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, is that saying that a woman should never be in a place of teaching? Absolutely not. That's not what uh, the word is teaching here. If, if that were so, uh, folks, we'd be in serious trouble. Uh, it, 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 he's speaking here of the issue of the authority in church and in the home. Not that she can't teach a man something, but God is just saying, here is the line of authority and symmetry that I have set up as the pattern. Watch verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Now, He's talking about two things in this couple of passages. First, he's talking about God's order of creation. Uh, God created man and then he created the woman. He's also talking about the order of sin, that Eve was deceived and was deceived by the enemy and fell into sin, but not Adam. Adam was not deceived. He went into that with his eyes wide open, choosing to be rather in a state of sin with his wife rather than in a state of holiness with God. So he's talking about this order of things. May I say, fathers, you are called by God, anointed by God, set apart by God to be the head of your spouse and of your family. 
I will say a word here about single parents for just a minute. I'd be amiss if I didn't. They're, they're my heroes here. You say, what am I supposed to do if I don't have a man in my house and I'm trying to raise kids? What am I supposed to do? Well, there are two or three things. First of all, I believe you need to pray for wisdom. The Bible says, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God and God will not withhold it, but will give it to you lavishly. The second thing is that you come back and you place yourself under the umbrella of the protection of your father. And the third thing, if your father is not available, then you submit yourselves to the authority of the church and place yourself under the umbrella of that. I could take you over to Deuteronomy chapter two and I could give you that biblical mandate or that biblical principle there uh, when, when that occurred, when they parents submitting themselves to the elders of the church that then helped them deal with the problems that were to come up. Let, let, let suffice it to say, men, for your own sake, for the sake of God, for the sake of your wife and the mother of your children, assume the responsibility that God has given you and designed for the family as the head of your home. Number two, I believe the essential of consistent parental teaching. I believe it's essential. If we're gonna see our homes come back to God, we're going to have to see Bible instruction, Bible teaching out of the home. Look with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter number six. Deuteronomy chapter number six, and I want you to see verse number four. Deuteronomy chapter six and verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy six, verse five. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee on this day shall be in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk about it when you're in the house. Talk about it when you're walking together. Talk about it when you go to bed at night. Talk about it when you get up in the morning. Bind them on your hands and they'll be a frontlet in your eyes. Write them on the posts of your house and on your gates. Now I can't read this uh, without really coming to the realization that godly biblical instruction was not part of the Hebrew home. I can't read it and believe that. Matter of fact, if you do any kind of study at all, you're gonna discover that within the confines of that Hebrew home, uh, the parents taught their children over 32 and a half hours a week on the average, taught them the word of God. They didn't send them off to parochial school. They didn't send them off somewhere for somebody else to assume that responsibility. Uh, they assumed the word of God as being their authority and they took that as truth and they taught that to their children. Now, I do this with great fear and trepidation, but go back to Ephesians chapter number four, and I want you to see verse, excuse me, chapter number six and verse four, and I want you to see what God's word says. Now, notice. Now, once again, I realize that it's Mother's Day, but I promise you, I, you, you want to see a happy mother? You get a daddy doing what God wants daddy to do, and you're going to see a happy mother. All right, here we go. Verse four, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, whose responsibility is it to teach kids the word of God? Whose responsibility is it to teach them to fear the Lord and to know him with all of their heart? He didn't say that it was the daycare centers. He didn't say that it was a child development center. He didn't say that it was the babysitter. God's word says you fathers make sure that you assume the responsibility of the instruction of the children. You say, well preacher, I sure do thank God for First Baptist. 
And we've got a great Awana program. The life groups are amazing. The teachers are just so on fire and filled with the spirit. By the way, if you're not in a life group, you need to be in a life group. Uh, it, it's one of the most powerful hours that you're ever going to spend during the week. But anyway, you, you dad say, I'm glad that I've got that as a support. I don't know what I would do without that. Well, that's all wonderful and it's all good. But the fact of the matter is we only have your kids for about an hour and 45 minutes a week. While at the same time, your children watch an average of 28 hours a week of television. They spend hours a week in front of a computer screen or some gaming device or an iPhone while in playing games on the iPhone. Who do you think then with that kind of imbalance, who do you think your kids are going to draw their values from? It's amazing, isn't it? You say, well, Pastor, you, you have to understand, I have a job and I have responsibility and I work about 50 hours a week and, and my wife, I, I, I just don't have time, but boy, my godly wife, she's so amazing and, and, and she's t training our kids up. You know, that sounds wonderful, but the fact of the matter is about 95% of the women that are teaching and training your children are doing it because dad is just simply shirking his responsibility. Not because he doesn't have enough time. Because he's got other priorities. May I say it does not relieve you of the responsibility. And sometimes you prostitute your stewardship of having a child when you don't do what God says for you to do. Now, let, let, me, let me say this. Now, let's, let's just say, okay, I'm going to teach him. Well, that's useless unless you are living what you teach. Unless you're living in front of them what's coming out your mouth. I'd love to be able to take you over to 1 Samuel. Uh, we did a study of many, year, many years ago now uh, out of 1 Samuel, and we did verse by verse all the way through the book. We get over there into chapter number two, and there's a priest in there by the name of Eli. Now, Eli had a couple of sons. And uh, the Bible says that they were unbelievers. They didn't know God. Had never followed the Lord. Uh, they were lost in their sin. Now, that's a sad commentary, not so much on the boys in this particular instance as it was their priestly father. If you get into chapter 2 and to verse 22, here, here's a, uh, an, an amazing and astounding revelation about these boys. Listen to what he says. Eli was very old and heard that all his sons did unto Israel, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. See, what these boys were doing were taking advantage of their daddy's position at the church and they were seducing and enticing the women of the congregation and committing adultery with them. In verse number 23, the Bible says, and Eli said unto them, why do you do these things? For I hear of the evil dealings from the people. Well, what happened was Eli had so distanced himself from his family, was so out of touch with his family, he had no clue what was going on with the boys and had to hear it from the congregation. Wow. Verse 29. Wherefore, now this is God dealing with Eli. God's saying this to Eli. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. In other words, Eli, what in the world do you think you're doing? You've been greedy and selfish. You've been a thief and a robber. You have taken that which was not ever meant for you, and if you've used it for your own greedy, selfish purposes. You've been teaching certain things of the word with your mouth, 
but your actions don't back up what your teaching is. You're not living out what you say that you believe. Now look at chapter three and verse 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Uh, so he had to answer for what he had done. He had sowed a life of looseness and now he was reaping that harvest. Yeah, I, I love you uh, deeply. I love you with all my heart. Uh, my opinion, there's no greater church in the world than First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. And I want you to love me. And yet I'm going to tell you, I know exactly firsthand what this passage is talking about. Um, when I was in my mid-twenties, God called me to preach. The next day I went in to my job and I resigned and went part-time. I enrolled at North Greenville University. I had 30 hours a week at Sears and I went, never took less than a full load. And, and, I, and I'm telling you, friend, you got to hear my heart. I'm not saying this with any element of pride, but with a lot of shame that's been forgiven and put under the blood. Pastoring my first church, working 30 hours a week, going to school no less than full time for eight years. One of the most difficult lessons that I ever learned, my little five-year-old daughter, that I love with all my heart taught me. I was driven for success. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to prove as I had been from my adolescent years that I was worth something. And so I gave Sears my best. I gave the university as best as I could. I, I, I gave my church the best of the best. Came home well, actually, it was leaving one morning. And uh, my little five-year-old looked up at me and she said, Daddy, I want to know Jesus. Would you tell me how that I could know Jesus? So busy that I put my little five-year-old off. And I said, later on, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. And out the door I went to succeed. My little girl waited up on me until way late in the night. She looked up at me with those beautiful brown eyes. She was so tired and sleepy, I can still see it even today. And she said, Daddy, Daddy, do you have time now? to tell me about Jesus. I'm just saying to you, friend, you got to really be careful that your walk matches your talk, man. That your life matches what you say that you believe. But what did I learn? A life's lesson. Let me give you the next one, if I could, the next essential. Number three is a willing obedience from the child. You teenagers, you children that are in the building now, I want you to perk up. I want you to listen for just a few minutes. Because once again, you are in partnership with your mom and with your dad in this essential makeup of what the family must look like. And he simply says a willing obedience. In chapter number six of the book of Ephesians, in verse number one, the Bible says, children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now, hear my heart a minute because this is not popular preaching. This is not popular teaching. We've got a world of kids today that have been let go without any kind of restraints whatsoever. We've got children that are seeking for emancipation from their parents and suing their parents and, and refusing to come under the authority of their parents. 
parents. So it's not a popular word today. But the Bible says to us children, children, obey your parents. And he gives four reasons why. First of all, he says in the Lord. That means because you are a Christian, you are to obey your parents. It didn't say if your mom's a Christian or if your dad's a Christian. It said because you're a Christian. You need to be obedient to your kids. Number two, to your parents. He said, because it's the right thing to do. I love how practical the Bible is, don't you? It's just the right thing to do. Obey your mom and your daddy. It's right, number three, because it's the first command with a promise that it would be well with you. And then fourth, that you may live a long, healthy life. That's a powerful promise to the children if that obedience breeds that into a child. Now that's not normal. It's not natural for children to be obedient. Now, I've raised two. I've got five grandkids. And I can just tell you, obedience is not normal and it's not natural in kids. How many of you have ever had a four-year-old and you say to you, your moms, you say to that four-year-old, now, uh, honey, you go over there and pick up all your toys and you put them in the toy chest. And how many of you had a kid four years old that said, yes, ma'am, I'll go do that right now. And boom, right in there and goes and picks them up and puts them in the toy chest. Now, I want to tell you, if you've got a kid like that, there's something seriously wrong with your kid. <laughs> seriously wrong with your kid. Needs help. Why is that? Because obedience is just not normal. It's not natural. Now let me give you number four. It's biblical discipline. Uh, so we, we've talked about a godly order here. We, we've talked about uh, obedience. Now, let's talk about biblical discipline for a minute. In Psalm 127, you may want to look there with me for just a minute. Psalm 127 and verse number three, the Bible says it is, uh, uh, low children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Can I say to you, parents, children are not a threat. Children are not problematic. You got a quiver full of children doesn't mean you've got a quiver full of problems. They're not here to make you gray and they're not here to make you bald. They're a blessing. And so the word of God here is speaking with authority. And he says they're like arrows that are aimed at the target. And whether or not it hits the target that they are aimed at is dependent on the discipline that they receive. There's a Hebrew word that is right here for discipline that means guiding one through a tunnel so that they will not get derailed. It's a powerful word. It's a powerful term. That is the objective of all discipline for the welfare. Listen, it's for the welfare of the child. It's for their good. Now, I don't believe you ever ought to, I don't believe you ever ought to discipline your kids when you're angry. Now, I know that takes the fun out of it sometimes. <laughs> but you ought to, Get away. I don't ever advocate discipline when parents are angry. Get away from the situation and get control of your anger. And then come back and biblically discipline the child. Uh, I don't have time this morning, um, but I, I want to give you, if you want to just write it down, maybe somewhere in the margin of your Bible, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15. Those are just some of the passages. Grady Wilson, some of you older folks uh, will remember Grady Wilson. Grady Wilson said that in his house, there was a leather strap that hung up on the wall and uh, uh, right either underneath it or above it was a sign that said, I need thee every hour. Mm. 
You see, the tendency today is just to let children run wild. I, I've been in more homes than I can even want to think about where the kids are just running the asylum. It's amazing to me how they are getting away totally unrestrained. Hey, let me help you with something before we go on to the next one. You ready for this? Unrestrained kids are going to grow up to be unrestrained adults. Discipline, biblically discipline your kids. Now, you know, the Bible says that, you know, you, you, you put the rod to the back. He says, and the word says, he will not die. You're not going to kill him. All right, here we go. You, you got to be careful, though. You know, I understand you don't want to break the spirit of the child. I know that there's a line right there. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, if you're seeking God about that, God will provide for you in weighing discipline with your kids. All right, num number, uh, number four. And I'm not sure that this is not the most important. A compassionate concern and love. Compassionate concern and love. Go, go to the scriptures with me to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. And, and, and this is a passage I believe that's meant for the family. Now watch this in verse number 12. Colossians chapter three, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. A compassionate Concern and love. If the passage that I read you just now is not meant for the home, it's not meant for anywhere else. We are to exhibit that kind of spirit in our home. Let me ask you now two or three questions as I bring this message to a conclusion. Are you ready? Question number one. Is my family the most important group to me in my life? Is my family the most important group to me in my life? Question number two. Do I pray daily for my family? Do I pray daily for my family? Question number three. Do I demonstrate, do I demonstrate my love and my concern and my compassion for my family or do I just mouth it? And question number four, do I exalt love over material things? Many years ago, um, probably over 20 years ago, I was reading a book by Gordon MacDonald. And he, he gave a, a note, he, he published a note that he had received from a 17-year-old boy out on the West Coast who had run away from home. And this note was sent back to this boy's mom and daddy. Now I want you to listen to what he said. And maybe even apply it to your life some. Dear folks, thank you for everything, but I am going to Chicago to try to start a new life. You ask me why I did those things and why I caused you so much trouble? The answer's easy, but I wonder if you'll understand me. Remember when I was six or seven and I used to just want you to listen to me? I remember all the nice things you gave me at Christmas and birthday, and I was happy with them for about a week. At the time I got those things, I was happy, but the rest of the time during the year, I really did not want presents. I just wanted all the time for you to listen to me like I was someone who felt things too. 
I remember when I was young, I, I felt things, but you always said you were too busy. Mom, you were a wonderful cook and kept everything so clean. And you were so tired from doing all those things that made you busy. But you know something, Mom? I would have liked crackers and peanut butter just as well if you had only sat down with me for a while during the day and said to me, tell me all about it and see if I can understand. I think all the kids that are doing so many things that grown-ups are tearing their heart out about today are looking for someone that will have time to listen just for a few minutes and who will really treat them as a grown-up who might be useful and polite to them. If you folks had said, pardon me, when you interrupted me, I would have dropped dead. If anybody asks you where I am, Tell them that I have gone looking for someone who has time because I have a lot to talk about. Love to you all, your son. Do you get it? Parents, do you get it? I hope you don't have to learn that lesson as hard as I did. I think about our senior adults. I think about us getting so wrapped up in life that we just kind of push them off to the side sometimes. And we don't have time for them. We want somebody else to take care of them. We've got other things that are more important to do than to spend time with a kid who might just want to talk or to spend time with some senior adults who have given their all and just shunned them and letting somebody else minister to their needs while we do our own thing. Now, I don't believe honoring parents ever stops as long as they're living. Didn't say if they're honorable, said just to honor. I believe it's important that we realize the essentials that God has laid out in his word. Men, you're the head of your family. And it's a responsibility that you cannot and must not shirk because there's an accounting day coming. And women, the Bible says we're to be in submission to that leadership. Children, you're to obey your parents. Parents, you're to discipline your kids. And you know what? Our walk better match our talk if we're really going to make a difference.